Welcome to Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. I'm Terry Thornton. I'm Curator of Education. Glad to have you here tonight. Most of you know that Tuesday Evenings is a weekly lecture series. Um, next week, uh, just a reminder that next week, even though it's spring break, um, we are going to have a makeup date for last Tuesday's um, cancellation due to inclement weather. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, artist Misty, uh, Misty Kessler and Allison Smith, uh, who are both represented in the Modern's recently opened Framing Desire, which I hope most of you have had the opportunity to see, will be here in conversation with the curator of the exhibition, Andrea Carnes. So I hope you come back next week, and I encourage you to bring a friend. Um, tonight, we are happy to welcome New York-based artist Jonathan Shipper. Um, I know that uh, many of you are big fans of Jonathan's work and have followed his career to date. Um, for those of you who are new to the work, I think you're in for a real treat, an opportunity to revisit the value and intrigue of uh, making in art and then um, to give some thought to the uh, inevitable entropy, the entropy that happens um, after the making that follows. Um, Jonathan Shipper was born in Chico, California. He has um, a BFA from San Francisco Art Institute and earned an MFA from the Reinhardt um, School of Sculpture in Baltimore in 1998 with uh, an MICA fellowship from 1996 to 98. From early on, um, even as an undergrad, um, Jonathan received recognition for his ambitious ideas and uh, well-honed skills with a number of fellowships and awards. Uh, in, 2011, in 2001, he received a fellowship from the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He has since exhibited widely in the U.S. and internationally, and just to name a few of the exhibitions in uh, recent years, Jonathan was included uh, in last year's State of the Art, uh, a large survey of national trends um, at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, um, Arkansas. And in 2003, there was the, uh, 20th, uh, the 20th anniversary exhibition of Pierogi Gallery, where Jonathan is represented in Brooklyn, as well as his solo exhibition that year, Detris, at um, Pierogi's um, large annex space, The Boiler Room. Um, his work was chosen for the 2012 uh, Guangzhou uh, Triennial, and in 2011, he was included in um, Art of Deceleration um, at the Kunst Museum in Wolfsburg, Germany. Also under construction, a traveling exhibition that originated at uh, Museum Tongli in uh, Basel, Switzerland. And um, the solo exhibition, Auto Body, that some of you may have had the opportunity to see or know about from Ballroom, Texas in Marfa, Texas. I mean, Ballroom Marfa in Marfa, Texas. My apologies. Um, of course, there is more, but for the sake of time, I will conclude with uh, Jonathan's exhibition that we in Fort Worth are anxiously anticipating, which opens uh, March 28th at Fort Worth Contemporary Arts of uh, TCU. And tonight, of course, we are here for insights from the artist himself. So please join me in showing appreciation for Jonathan Schiffer's, uh, Schiffer's willingness to share his work and ideas with us tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Um, let me start the timer so I can. OK, so this goes back about 15, 18 years ago. So this um, piece is three people hanging from a gantry crane. And the switch you see out in the front, that switch there allows you to uh, basically shake any one of the uh, people in the machine that you choose. <laughs> so what this came from was uh, I grew up in on a ranch in California. And um, let me look at another slide. This is it in motion. You can see uh, people moving back and forth. So um, in the ranch, you uh, cattle had a very different uh, relationship to objects than we usually do. The, uh, yeah, yeah, lots of apparatus to manipulate the cattle, to castrate, to doctor, to whatever it might be. And um, I was always interested in those apparatuses growing up and what they, uh, how they uh, had no relationship to whatever a cow's ego might or might not be. 
and um, thought a lot about how ultimately we share so much in common with cattle in terms of our physical makeup. We're you know made of muscle and bone, but all the objects we relate to, you know, if it's a car, it's a Porsche or a Chevrolet, they're all made to relate to our egos first and uh, and to our bodies uh, second, well, or in, in in conjunction with our egos, appeal to our egos. So. Um, I really, this piece was really about trying to uh, underline the physicality and the commonality that we have with those animals. Um, not really trying to say it's good or bad, um, not really interested in that in general, but just that there is this commonality, that we are ultimately uh, flesh and bone and you know we, we go through life and it, it's, it's so hard to really our whole minds are made to, you know, think other things. You know, we're made to think, you know, I'm a scholar, I'm a, you know, musician, I'm a whatever. But you're still an object. You're flesh and bone, like the cattle, like the sheep or the dog or all the other mammals that share the planet with us. So, this was my way of sort of bringing people into that uh, space and. Uh, it was interesting, I, this is uh, something I did to others and myself at the same time. And uh, it seems very um, aggressive, and in a way I, I suppose it is. But the experience of being in it is actually kind of just the opposite, since you're, you're, all your power is removed, like you're just hanging there as if you're a thing. And um, you don't have the ability to interact with anybody to say no or yes or any of those things that we do all day long. Um, so it was really kind of this, um, I don't know the right word, but it really felt empowering in a strange way because you're just, you sit there and all the rest of the world is taken away from you and you know, you relate to it in a totally different way. You, you know, have the vision of the floor beneath you and and things like that. Um, so it was really kind of the opposite of what it might seem, being in it. And um, the aggressiveness of SOAR, of course, is part of the piece, but uh, you know, ultimately it's, it's interesting how it switches when you're in it. Now this piece came uh, about five years later, maybe, I'm guessing. But um, this is a similar piece. Um, and uh, what you're looking at is it in construction. This isn't the final piece. So on uh, what, the way it worked is uh, people could get into either side. And um, let me skip over this for a second. We'll come back to that. And this is somebody in it. And each person had a controller that would control the other person. So they, could, they couldn't see them. They couldn't, um, because you're facing the opposite way. Um, but you could manipulate them. So you could hit a button and something would happen to them. But since they were connected, whatever you did to them happened to you in some way. And some of, you didn't have power over the buttons in that you didn't know what they did. They just had four big buttons and you hit them. And sometimes it would do th things like both people would rotate and then sometimes it would just flip the other person upside down. And um, so, uh, then the things we skipped over. These uh, are two masks uh, worn by uh, the uh, uh, musical component of the piece. So I was interested in, these are all things ultimately that are about my childhood. Uh, growing up cattle, the manipulation, and then the state fair where you had people with rock and roll coming in and you had amusement rides and you always had some strung out guy playing, you know, his ACDC too loud while you, kids were throwing up on the uh, whatever <laughs> apparatus they were being thrown around on. And so I wanted to have uh, a, a musical component and, um, but I wanted it to, I always liked the, um, well, what I did to the poor performers was they sang inside these helmets, there were two of them, and everything that they were playing was electrical uh, instruments. So without the amplification, there was really no, no, uh, not a lot of sound, basically quiet. It was a room full of lots of people and they would play, but they could hear themselves because it was all going through uh, amplification system. And then they would, um, 
when the machine would go on, it would all get turned on, and everybody else would hear what they were playing. So it was uh, this, you know, idea about live versus uh, recorded. And um, it, I, throughout my work, I've always been interested in how, um, you know, we're, we're in an increasingly mediated society. You know, everything we do is, you know, taken. We take pictures of everything that we do. And we relate to everything through all these photographs and 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 media endlessly, and um, but it's never, you know, being a sculptor and being three dimensional. There's always things that I felt are left out. So I think that component was, you know, playing on that idea of live versus media, and you know, it being a sculpture and a performance, but then trying to turn that performance on its head and be like a, a recording and that it can just be turned on and off and manipulated um, in you know, kind of an awkward way. This is a drawing of its construction. So at this point was my first sort of introduction into, I do a lot of 3D modeling and, and manipulation and drawings to make these objects. They become increasingly complex and uh, this is sort of an early drawing of that complexity. So like I was interested in, you know, how this computer could just turn the, you know, these are basically the same drawing drawn on itself again and again and again. Um, and how that three dimensional world and time and, and everything can combine into a drawing that, uh, that has a uh, history of the making and the thinking and uh, the three-dimensionality, and you know, ultimately, this is just a two-dimensional drawing. Uh, all right, so this is a piece shortly after that. This is called Fuck Me Now or Leave Me Forever. And uh, also goes back to two different memories of my childhood. This was made with Amelia Bewald as a, as a, as a um, collaborator. She did the, uh, I'm gonna use that biffy laser again. She did this part. Um, and I did the mechanism. And so what it comes from is uh, two memories, and they're both in uh, actuality slightly wrong. But um, I grew up in the mountainside, and we'd see these birds fly up super high, and then they would kind of tumble out of the air and then separate at the, right before they you know, hit the ground. And it's this um, badly remembered but actually remembered um, version of uh, the, the mating. So they, they do this ritual where they fly together and they kind of, you know, you don't really know what they're doing, but they tumble and then they separate and they just keep doing it. And I remember it from my childhood. And uh, then the fuck me now or leave me forever is from Top Gun, also from my childhood, very formative movie. And so, um, uh, is the button not working? There we go. That's a little closer view of it. So the way it worked, um, we don't have a video of it tonight, but uh, they would move up to the top of the thing, come together, kind of manipulate themselves on the way down, and then uh, come apart, and they would cycle again and again. Um, so uh, this is uh, skipping to a few years later. This is a construction photo of 215 points of view, or invisible sphere. So again, this is another uh, piece about media and about how we see things and don't see things. And um, so there's this idea in media that it gets you to the other end, that you uh, watch a war video and you know what's going on in Afghanistan. And you watch, you know, whatever video of something else and you know what happened. But I've always been struck at how, at how that's not actually true. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been in actual events that have been recorded and put on the news, and, and just the amount of errors in a simple, simple event are, are amazing. And um, so this isn't about the uh, documentation in terms of what happened, but the visual documentation. So what it is in physicality is 215 monitors and 215 cameras. And so it has two different ideas. One is that it's an invisible sphere, and obviously it's the opposite of invisible in every way. 
Um, you know, it's this big monstrous two, you know, it's over a ton in weight and it doesn't disappear at all. It calls total attention to itself. And um, so it's sort of poking fun at the idea that media can be invisible because it's not, you know, the, the whatever angle the photographer takes is a choice that influences how you take information back out of that media. And this sphere, the other thing that I find really interesting is that if you look at it, and it's hard to convey in uh, photographs, but you can sort of see here how each view is completely opposite, is completely different from the one next to it. And they're all in the same space, same lighting conditions, same environment, but it's, uh, it's just completely different. Um, we have a video here coming up. Is it going? There we go, okay. So uh, it's also movable. So originally the idea was that it would roll around in a space and uh, you know find new, <laughs> new points of view. But it, it uh, ended up weighing so much that uh, fear of squishing some small person uh, ended up, uh, yeah, <laughs> nixing that idea. Well, we have hung it a few times. So then you can move it around, and it's it's really nice when it moves around. But um, but yeah, going back to this idea, you can see like some of the screens interrelate, and others of them just you know, all of a sudden you're looking at some mouse in the corner or some lint ball that is uh, totally invisible or unnoticeable in a normal room. Um, so again, you know, about media and about how um, how media affects everything that we're dealing with. This is another piece that I made with Amelia. Uh, it's called Firebird and uh, also relates to nature and man's influence on nature. So it's, um, it's a engine out of a 1960 something, I should know, but I don't, uh, 69, you can quote me, uh, Firebird and um, then I, I like the idea that, you know, these cars are named after things that they're not, you know? Like, they're not birds. <laughs> they're kind of the opposite of birds. And, uh, you know, there's big, heavy pieces of metal. And uh, so I thought, well, what if this car really wanted to be a bird and wanted to be a tree and wanted to relate to nature? And so this is this awkward representation of what that transformation might be. And um, so Amelia did all the uh, more organic parts and I did the more structural parts and we collaborated on the idea. So it's, you know, this obnoxious, you know, giant, you know, yeah, exhaust, uh, you know, nasty big engine. And it works, so you can turn it on in a gallery. It was a lot of fun to turn it on in a gallery. We had the exhaust, we had to run it outside the gallery exhaust uh, building and we would turn it on water would condense in the pipes and some poor person would get water sprayed on them and, um, and the gallery would stink for an hour. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, a lot of fun. And I'm also interested in where sculpture sort of combines with uh, this muscle car aesthetic. You'll see it again. Um, I'm not really well liked by the muscle cars guy, but guys, but I actually have a lot of uh, love for them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's in America, if you're a guy and you, you know, and you feel like art is a bad word, um, which I feel like a lot of people do for whatever reasons, um, cars and the aesthetics in cars are, are, you know, a place where you can let out those aesthetic ideas and, you know, talk about line and color and, and, and still feel you know, whatever, that's, <laughs> but anyways, I'm interested in where those things overlap with uh, the art world. And uh, this piece, you know, is a muscle car engine and, you know, painted in, you can't see it in the photos, but this fancy pearlescent white paint that's quite beautiful. Um, and here he's watering the tree slash car engine, whatever. <laughs> All right, so this is a shift here a little bit. These are two classical sculptures that I purchased online. So um, they, uh, and then built a, con a mechanism around them. So this is a mechanism that hangs up in the air. 
and then you can see how they fit together. And what happens is the mechanism uh, slowly rubs these objects together and uh, slowly erodes them. And um, thinking about a few different things, one is just the how relationships, this is a this is the same piece, essentially, just a bigger version, so I'll keep talking. Um, how relationships change each other, you know, for good or bad. Everything, everything we meet has an influence on us and changes us. And, um, and uh, also really interested in the fundamental idea of what art is and what um, creativity is. Um, in that uh, in order to make anything, you have to sort of destroy something else. I, the easiest example is if you make a tree, you destroy a table. I mean, I'm sorry, if you make a table, you destroy a tree. Sorry, I said that too many times. Um, yeah, maybe we could just, anyways. Um, so, you know, you're always changing something else. So this act of creativity, this, you know, beautiful idealized act, is also an act of destruction, is an act of uh, changing, you know. And um, so, this, and also I've been interested in this idea that, uh, this, this fundamental idea of art, that you take an idea, you put it into an object, you place that object somewhere, other people can come to that object and extract that idea out by looking at it. And, um, and how, you know, it's, it's fundamentally has issues in that people change, the objects change, everything's always in motion. You know, our ideas of what the object is, the society around the object is always in flux. So there, you know, that, that, that ideal is never really, really uh, met. In that, you know, you see a mother well 20 years ago, you see a different thing than you see the mother well now, even if it's been perfectly, uh, you know, contained and hasn't changed, which isn't a reality any, either. You know, everything changes. Uh, yeah, I was looking at, uh, at Marfa, we were looking at the um, Judd's hallway of boxes, and we noticed that every box was no longer in line. And it was just from the heating and cooling of those boxes, they had slowly walked on their own. So, you know, I'm sure Judd is, is turning in his grave that they're no longer lined up and symmetrical in the way he meant. But the world's always in flux, no matter how hard we try not to. And then this piece, I think, ultimately is, is uh, embracing that. You know, I think it's beautiful, and I think that creativity is about change and about the balance in between destruction and creation in a way that, you know, creates something new and for the future and, you know, takes from the past. So, you know, that's also about these sculptures and that they're, you know, art history. Uh, they're bad, they're just bought bad reproductions. But, you know, the idea is, is that art takes from the past, destroys it and creates something new. And that's what it should do. And, and destruction is part of life and, you know, needs to be embraced and needs to be, you know, and not wholly, nothing can be wholly embraced, but, you know, needs to be respected. And, and um, this one here is the same piece, but kind of the orgy version. So it's called Sexy, Shameful, Naked, Nude, which came from the eBay title of one of these sculptures. So <laughs> I just thought it was so perfect. And, uh, yeah, uh, let's see, go get it. So this is a close-up of it. You can kind of see um, what they're made out of. They're, they're uh, yeah, just these, I, I love the idea of these, um, these classical reproductions that aren't either, you know? They're, they're made in China and they're brand new and they reproduce an idea that, that you know, has been exchanged so many times that who knows what the original idea was anymore. But um, I have a lot of affection for him. So this is a piece in the same idea. This poor guy uh, was made out of plaster in the bottom and cut him into pieces and uh, started uh, just adding simple kind of animatronic appendages to them. Uh, I did a lot of work prior to this for Jim Henson and places like that doing this kind of thing for the Muppets and things like this. 
Um, but I thought it'd be interesting if classical, you know, this idea of this classical sculpture was combined with Slayer. And um, so Slayer is a uh, thrash metal band. I had to, I, I said in an interview that they were a death metal band and 10,000 15 year old boys told me how dumb I was. Um, <laughs> And uh, anyways, thrash metal band. So I converted Slayer's music to player piano reel, which I'm pretty sure I have the only copy of Raining Blood on player piano reel. <laughs> and then made a self-made apparatus to turn the, the notes into motion. So uh, play here. I think that's up there. Yeah, OK. So um, well, you can. So what it does is each note gets turned into a movement um, and read by you know, uh, a series of light sensors. And um, uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it was fun in this piece to try to combine these things that have nothing to do with each other, but ultimately do. So this piece here uh, came a little bit after that. This is a teacup that I took and I broke. So I dropped it on the floor, which surprisingly took a little more effort than I th thought. It was a very strong teacup. I had to drink. I had four of them, and, and to break it into six pieces was really difficult. Um, uh, so what happens is I broke it. And let's look at the video, which is here. There we go. So that's me breaking the original cup. The grid on the floor is so that I can uh, understand exactly what happened later on, looking at the video footage. And um, so then I made a mechanism that reproduces that moment endlessly. Um, again, this is that idea that, that, to me, the most interesting moment is when things change, the transformation from one state of being, this, this cup, this perfect, like, you know, thing that you drink tea out of to this thing that's just garbage. And uh, the idea of the piece was, uh, you know, ultimately a tongue in cheek idea and that it, it is impossible, but it's trying to hold on to that moment where things are transforming back and forth. Um, I feel like as an artist, that's always what you're searching for is this, is this moment where for just a few seconds or minutes or whatever, everything's perfect and it's clear and you see this, this moment that reflects life in a way that's beautiful and uh, gets you somewhere else and then all of a sudden, you know, a bill arrives and you come back into the real world. Um, so that was my attempt to, to stay in that moment, I suppose. Um, this is an early drawing for what's ultimately the same piece uh, it's a much larger, more complicated version. Um, but this piece simulates taking a bottle and throwing it against the wall and having it explode into a million pieces. So there it is with the armature at the end. And here's the apparatus. It's this big, complicated apparatus with, I think, 37 different motors that are all synced via the computer um, in order to make it all happen. And, um, you know, there's the same idea as the other one. It's, it's also interesting to me to take this very, like, juvenile, very simple act and, and, and um, mull over it and, and, and have it be the center of your world for, like, a year and a half. Um, you know, and that throwing the bottle and breaking it against the wall takes a fraction of a second. And, but recreating it again and again takes this long amount of time. And um, so it's a very, in the end, imperfect uh, reproduction. You can see all kinds of flaws, and there's been a lot of debate 
with me and other people on how perfect it should be. And to me, it's ultimately not about perfection because there is no perfection. There's always going to be these seams. You can't turn it from a bottle to a broken bottle magically. And um, so to me, it, it's these imperfections that make it art, that make it interesting. Um, this is the moment that it would theoretically hit the wall and then break into pieces. And so it slowly would be tumbling to the floor. And then it's a second it will stop and go back. So again, it's, it's basically a, um, I'm the kind of artist that uh, find a few ideas and mull over them for a few years and keep making the same piece about those ideas and, until I'm forced to do something else. <laughs> I still, every time I look at it, I'm imagining how I could change it and turn it into something slightly different. Um, probably do it again, but anyways. Uh, all right, uh, this is the first model of the car crash, which uh, I, um, I, uh, this is the piece that I'm most known for and I've done the most time, uh, done in the most different places the most times. Um, I've crashed, I don't know, maybe 20 cars now. I get hate mail almost every week from muscle car aficionados that uh, threaten to kill me and, and different things because I'm destroying these cars that they love. But, um, but I love them too. I mean, they're beautiful. I think um, there's, well, stepping back from that a second, just um, what it is, is it's a re, um, it's a simulation of a head-on collision. So it's modeled after a 30 mile per hour head-on collision. And um, it simulates it over anywhere from four days to six months, or even longer, but that's the longest we've done it so far. and. Um, so when you come to it, you come to a slice in time. The event in real life only takes a fraction of a second um, or whatever and uh, is over. And we've seen it again and again in film and videos. Um, but it's really a hard moment to know. I think that's why you see it again and again is because it happens so fast in a film. You can see it in slow motion, but you see it from an angle. You see it from a uh, person's point of view. And you never get to touch it. You never get to see exactly how this thing is crumbling. Um, and so this piece stretches that out over that time. And it takes what is a very uh, you know, life-threatening and dramatic event and turns it on its 180 degrees from that in that it's totally safe and you can touch it and have a beer next to it and contemplate it. Um, this is a video of a time lapse of it. And um, so you get to see it in a way that you never get to see it in real life. And um, going back to these cars and why I chose these cars is, uh, in my opinion, these, are, these cars, for what they were, were one of the best examples of America and um, they really reflected a time so well and uh, we wear these cars like um, like we you know beyond even what we wear clothing in the United States it's it's our identity manifested in metal around us it's what we want people to think of us what we want people to know and often it's not what we are but we want but what we want them to know so we relate to them in this very strong way. And uh, this is the European version of the same piece. So we got a BMW and a, and a Mercedes. But, um, and we all you know, have this relationship to these cars. We've been in them, and, uh, or we had an uncle that owned one, or wh whatever it might be. And uh, if you look back, and we go back to the piece that I showed you in the beginning, where it's the people in the piece, to me, there's still people in these pieces. When you look at them, everybody imagines their relationship to an auto accident, their relationship to the car. So even though there's nobody physically in them, it's part of how you look at that piece. And, um, and it's this amazing manifestation of who we are, and it's the end of 
what that that version of what we are. So the car is is meeting its final end, which we all know is going to happen to us at one point or another. And there's these amazing mysteries of coming into the world and leaving the world and whatever whatever your opinion on where we go before or after, it's undeniable that it's gonna happen and it's interesting. This is me drunk driving in a museum in, in Switzerland. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and this is in, in Brooklyn. And uh, so, you know, they, it, it, it's this thing that you can really feel when it's happening. There's all kinds of interesting small notes. This is a single version um, in, uh, in England. The, uh, you can hear it while it happens. There's a slow kind of tinking sound that's similar to what uh, a car sounds like when it's, um, when it's cooling off. And so you, you do hear and feel things. And when you're watching it, you sort of imagine that it's happening faster than it is, which is kind of this interesting, at least I do. You, you kind of feel like you've been there for five minutes and it's changed, but it probably hasn't much because <laughs> it's a, usually they're moving at about a millimeter an hour, so a very small amount. And, um, but you, you do feel it. You, you do know that this thing is transforming itself into, you know, and, and you're seeing the end of it. You know, it's kind of like in, in uh, watching it, it's kind of like watching, I, I feel like it's a lot like watching a log burn on a fire. And, you know, we've all stared at a log at a fire for hours. And, and I think it's the same kind of transformation. It's like going from a tree to ashes. And it's this, you know, transformation of materials and structure. And then, you know, who knows what's going to happen to those ashes, but it's all part of this cycle that we're all in uh, being on this planet. And um, so, uh, yeah, so this is it in Texas, uh, just down uh, in uh, Marfa. So uh, each manifestation changes a little bit, which is kind of fun. Uh, the cars we pick are a little different. Um, we did it in China and uh, it was interesting because we went to China and we hadn't picked the cars, but we kind of had an idea. And they said, okay, we got this lot with 200 cars in it and you can pick any car you want. And we went and uh, I always do it with a friend of mine who's an engineer who did a lot of the engineering, Carl. And um, so we see these Chinese police cars and we're like, we want those, those are super cool. And uh, they said, uh, yeah, no, that's too sensitive to the Chinese government. And then four hours later, we figured out that they had picked two cars for us, but were unwilling to tell us which cars. <laughs> and it took four hours for us to get to those cars. We picked every other car. And like, and the same thing, it's too sensitive to the Chinese government. And it's like, damn, that's a sensitive government. But anyways, they were good cars. I mean, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> it was a funny process. Um, all right, so this piece is uh, a little newer. Um, this is uh, about maybe a year or two, two years old, maybe. Uh, what it is, is, um, is it's 12 tons of salt and some water and um, a machine that uh, can move anywhere. If you look, it's these uh, four cables suspend this from in the middle of the room. And by varying the length of the computer uh, cables with the computer, you can move it anywhere you want. Um, and it builds things slowly out of salt. And um, then in the corner, you have a hot tub, which is feeding the water into the piece, which uh, then combines with the salt and, and makes structures. So it's, the idea is similar to these other pieces in that it's slowly, um, it's, it's uh, transforming these objects around you as you're watching them. Here it's creating, but it's also ends up destroying, like it will run into objects that it made before and uh, just constantly building. And I kind of wanted to make this uh, vista where you could view these objects um, almost in a kind of godlike, throne-like view. And that's, so that's where the hot tub came from. And um, 
So you can sit and drink beers and watch this sculpture work. These are a combination of different images that are either time lapse or whatever. It uh, worked very slow. It took hours to build anything, and um, but was constantly transforming this environment. Uh, sort of looking for this, you know, vantage point that doesn't exist in time and space, where like if you could imagine removing yourself from the planet and watching cities, you know, maybe you lived for thousands of years and you only, you know, your time frame was completely different. So, you know, uh, you would see cities growing and cities, uh, cities decaying. Um, if I talk about that a little bit, a lot of these pieces come from cinema and from other influences like that, the car crash and um, the others. There's a, a, a what they call time, uh, frame rate in film or video, and that's how many uh, frames per second. Human beings see anything above about 15 frames per second as continuous motion, and anything uh, below that as stills, so like two frames a second, or the slideshow, which was whatever, like a frame a minute, we see as stills. But things live at different frame rates, like a fly lives at a much higher frame rate, that's why they're hard to hit. And, and so they see the world differently, and a, and a tree doesn't have eyes, but lives at a different association, you know, it wakes up and follows the sun on a daily and follows the season, so its frame rate you know, doesn't, obviously it doesn't have eyes, but it, it has a different association with time. And, and so, you know, you, uh, these pieces are about changing those, uh, that, that frame rate and seeing how things change in conjunction with that frame rate. This piece here is called Slow Room. And um, what it is, is uh, this is in Bentonville in Arkansas, so not far from here. And, um, it's an imaginary kind of average room that we constructed. And then it's being slowly pulled into this hole that you can no longer see behind the objects in the room. So this took over two months. So when you watch it any given day, you're just watching again, like the car crash, this slice of it. And um, this what is more about that unending, inevitable tug of time. I mean, we all, note what we did last week and we imagine what we're going to do next week but we live in this slice of now that we're all in here and um, it's um, just about how uh, how that mystery of that and how it's constantly taking us somewhere and ultimately we don't know where that is or what that's about and um, Again, the piece, you know, we chose, I chose a room that for me is this kind of classic uh, imaginary space. I wanted it to be something that you could easily relate to, that um, you could imagine being a part of. Um, the same, as, same idea as in the car crash, that you imagine yourself as part of these objects. We've all sat in a room somewhat similar to this in a chair or a couch like these ones and might have an aunt or an uncle that, or a mother or father that has a room similar to this. And so even though there's no people in it, it's about ultimately it's a figurative sculpture in a sort of way. And it's about how we relate to these objects and how we relate to time and that, that constant pull and that constant um, inevitable future that we're moving into every moment. Um, and so this moves into the future, which uh, uh, I'm hoping to do this in, uh, we're looking at maybe in Montreal, we gotta, it's all tentative now. But basically a similar piece to the car crash, uh, in the, but it will be an airplane that gets slowly pulled into the, into the surface, which will probably just be a field or something like that. Um, this is again, just a preliminary drawing. These projects, I've always been interested in projects that entail, that I'm not sure I can do. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, once you've done something, it's, 
fun to do it again, but it's so much more fun to try to do something that you're not sure you can do. And um, that's always been where my interest has lied. Um, you know, either it's technical or feasible or whatever it might be. Um, I've always been interested in something that expands either technically or, or conceptually what the parameters are. So um, this would be an extension of the, of the car crash, ultimately a very similar idea, um, but manifested on a different scale uh, with a different uh, end to it. This piece is just a teaser for what's coming up next here at Fort Worth Contemporary Arts uh, coming the end of this month. So I'm not gonna tell you too much about it um, other than its uh, closest cousin is probably the car crash, but um, in, in how it's taking something from one extreme and changing it into a different extreme, taking something that We've all seen a million times in film and video and trying to present it in a way where you can come close to it and touch it, and not necessarily touch it, but come close to it <laughs> and uh, feel it in a way that, um, that is inaccessible uh, on an average day. So I think that's the end of what I got here. Hopefully that... Uh, uh, was interesting and uh, any questions or Usually found and usually well after they've been made. Like uh, some of them, I've more than once retitled pieces that are three years old. <laughs> like when I finally, oh, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, they're usually, I don't know, some drunken night when you connect to things and you're like, oh, that's what it's called. <laughs> I'm just observing these uh, slow-moving catastrophes that you put together and all the mechanical aspects of it. And I was wondering, uh, being from Chico, if, you're, uh, if you ever had any interaction with the Survival Research Laboratory I, in San Francisco? Yeah, I always wanted to, and I was always, I've met a few of the people, but not too much one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I showed up in San Francisco just after they sort of maybe reached some sort of peak. I mean, I'm sure there's multiple peaks, but um, they were there. They were, you know, they're probably, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years older than I was, maybe a little more than that even. And, um, but yeah, I always admired them. I always admired their, uh, I appreciated their bravado, their like, you know, the, the sort of we're gonna do it and this, you know, like just doing it in open fields and whatever. And um, totally appreciated that. But then, you know, this, con you know, this connection to the art world and yeah, it's definitely been an influence over the years I for just, sure. I kind of sense uh, some parallels in your work with their. Definitely, definitely. Um, what was the name of that collaborative? Uh, Survival Research Laboratories. And so they, uh, yeah, they did all kinds of different, uh, a lot of event-based pieces. So, you know, things with, they got really large scale with jet engines and, and um, I remember one was the opening or the, uh, the uh, groundbreaking of the MoMA in San Francisco. They let them have rain over the mud pit before it became a museum. And um, yeah, so uh, definitely interesting group of people. I'm not familiar with what they're doing nowadays, to be honest, but. Okay, I'm gonna throw one out then. Um, what it, can you talk a little bit about the process of your practice where you, I mean, 
what, how does it break down? Because you spend so much time, like you said, with an idea. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit of how that, you know, what the, yeah, what the peaks and... Yeah, it's a hard thing uh, because, well, making them is usually two or three years. And then what I usually do as a practice is... Um, whatever dumb idea I have at a given night, I take a little note on it and try to think about it for a few years. It's, it's on average probably three to five years after an idea comes into my head that it might turn into something and then another couple years after that that it actually is something that I'll show somebody. Um, the hope is, is that you know, if I'm interested in two or three years of this idea that maybe turning it into an object is worth the time that's going to entail. That's kind of the motivation. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's and it's you know I don't produce you know that many pieces. It's you know a maximum of maybe three a year, and so you know going down the road to production is a scary process in that you're really going to devote. I'm going to devote, you know, a good portion of my life to whatever this idea is. And so usually, yeah, it takes a few years before I'm confident enough to do it. And there's been more than one instance where a few months down the road of production, it's just halted. And <laughs> I got a giant half-made sculpture hanging from the, in my kitchen that's been there for, <laughs> that will never get finished. Can you tell us about how you pay for these what looks like very expensive products? It's a trick. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think as an artist, you have to be nimble and be willing to extend yourself and have a little bit of faith that things will work out in the end um, because I never have enough money in any of these projects to really, rarely is it like, oh, here's a budget, let's do it. It's more like, I really want to do it. I can get started and then a month in you stop because you run out of money and you do a job. Um, I've always been very active uh, making things for other people. Uh, I did a lot of art fabrication and a lot of architectural fabrication and now I have a business making glasses and cell phone cases. and. Um, for me, that's been the balance that makes sense. It's always hard because um, when somebody gives you money, no matter how altruistic that intent is, it comes with baggage. It comes with what they you know, imagine it's going to do, and that doesn't always sync up with what I imagine it should be. And it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing, but it's, it's difficult. And so. For me, the best balance is to have a source of income and to slowly work on these things. Um, sometimes I've been lucky enough to find institutions that have supported ideas and been able to move faster. The car crash and this piece um, has been supported by institutions that you know, sort of explain the idea and move forward through it, which is, uh, is great. Um, but uh, most of the time, they're self-funded over years, and then you know, presented and sold or not sold. And um, yeah, but it's a, it's always been <laughs> a tricky, tricky process. In talking about that process of um, you know what you intend it to be, do you learn things along the way that? that make you deviate from maybe the original plan? Or do you, do you come up with the plan and then you just stick to it? That's the idea? Um, I, I do, by the time I start building, it's usually been mulled over enough that it doesn't change that much from beginning to end. Um, there are changes like in the car crash, each one of those cars becomes different. And there's variables, like I've done three of the room pieces in different, and they've all been different rooms. And, and things like that change, you know, and it, it's kind of like changing the color of the car, but the car itself still sort of remains more or less similar. Um, so. But it's not a responsive kind of process. Not, generally not so much, yeah. Um, 
most of it is, most of that process happens before it gets started. And um, then it, by the time I get fabricating, it's usually more or less, cons you know, it will be, I mean, not completely, maybe 90 to 95% figured out. And then processes, engineering, and figuring out the, the mechanics and whatever it might be to make the actual object. Um, I've always loved the other kind of making, and uh, I didn't show it tonight, but I did make recently a piece that was more like that. Um, a sort of, yeah, so it, it really wasn't so figured out and more, you know, improvisational uh, in its construction, which I'd like to do more of. It's, um, it's a more enjoyable process in a certain kind of way in that you can go to the studio and feel creative, whereas sometimes with these pieces they get so long and they're so much figured out beforehand that when you're building isn't such a creative process but a fabrication process. But I've always been interested in both, so it's, it's not a <laughs> negative, but I do appreciate the other one from time to time. Um, will it be tricky to find the airplanes for this? I was surprised that it wasn't as tricky. We got one figured out. Um, planes are super, super expensive until they're not. So um, a, a plane that can't fly anymore, that isn't certified for air flight, becomes just scrap value. So. For the, for the plane piece, we found a DC-3, which is a big, iconic plane, for $30,000, which is a lot of money, but amazing for what you get, you know. It'll never fly again, but it's a, it's a you know, hell of a lot of human effort in this object, um, which, you know, I talked about a little bit, but it's also something I really love about this transformation. You know, when I look at these objects, when you look at this car, being a fabricator, and uh, this is something that the car guys don't necessarily usually get, is that I, I love all the work that went into that. I've done it myself, you know, I've, and I know what it's like, and I, and I respect all the man hours that went into it. Um, where I differ is that you can't keep it forever. <laughs> you know, there's only so much room for these objects on this planet, and if, you know, we kept everything, we'd be in a pile of history and instead of a pile of new. And we need to ma manipulate these things and change them, um, hopefully respectively, and there is room, certainly, for keeping things, but, but yeah. You mentioned with each of your pieces artistic concepts that go with it, like that moment of trans, uh, transformation or how something has to be destroyed to create something mm -hmm. new. In your personal process, do you start with an artistic concept Never. and then try to make something for it? Or are you just thinking of something cool to do? Thinking of something cool, it's always... What it means. Yes, always. It's, it's uh, you know, just imagining shit and okay, why do I keep thinking about that one? And, and you know, why is it like yeah, that? yeah, always like that. Um, I don't think there's any example of the opposite. You know, it's it's, but hopefully, thinking over it over time, you you know, by the time it gets made, you have enough faith that it's you know has ramifications. Be you know, and and the fact that it's interesting is, why is it interesting? yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. What is its reason? I definitely, know. definitely. Cool. I did not hear uh, whether you went to MIT for your engineering <laughs> abilities or not. In what? No, everything. I, I was art school. My uh, my dad's a uh, computer programmer, IT guy, and sort of an engineering type in general. And so the minute I got out of, not for any, you know, I love my father, but just, you know, as the normal instinct of any young man to do the opposite of what your father did, uh, I wound up in art school, you know, making ceramic stuff. Um, I've always had a, a love-hate relationship to technology um, in that 
I'm obviously drawn to it and interested in it, but I'm also very suspect of what it has to offer. In that, you know, society, uh, okay, well, if you go, like this gets a little crazy, but uh, if you go to what religion had to offer, it, it answered these big questions, right? Like where we came from and where we're going. And now, today, technology has taken the forefront in a lot of people's minds for a lot of those questions. It tells us, you know, what's out there in the cosmos, and it tells us, you know, all these different things that are beyond our day-to-day -day experiences. And, um, but, not that I think that it's wrong, but I think that it's, I'm suspect of it. I don't, you know, this idea that, you know, the next iPhone is gonna solve some problem I think is ultimately this fallacy that drives industry, you know, like it's going to solve some problems and create other problems, you know. Now we can't go to a dinner and actually talk to anybody without them picking up their phone, you know, it's just, but now we can show them pictures of all our children instantly and all those things. So, um, so uh, you know, as a person, I've always been drawn to like running away from technology and, you know, there's half of me that would love to live in the sticks and you know, and, you know, run around in the mud. And then there's another half of me that, you know, wants this newest piece of technology and is really interested in how it interacts with human beings and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a constant fight <laughs> inside me. That's great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.